If you asked her to talk about herself, uh, she was very reluctant to do so. She, she was an odd mix of, of a country girl from Utah and one of uh, uh, considerable sophistication. I think she surprised everybody. And I, I don't think that they thought this little old lady up in this little old place called the candy store was, was going to uh, do what she did. She had this world, and that world was that gallery. She seldom left it. I can just see your plates that you had up there. Well, uh, all of the things the Gilhuli Moose had, and I think that Arneson had, had a, a little plaque uh, of three ceramic things that said Candy Store Gallery. She always gave you a warm welcome. Always. And you never knew what to expect inside. Or outside, for that matter. Remember the big Gilhuli uh, credit card roll pool? You know, oh, the yeah, enormous that's what thing. I was talking about. Yeah. She just had it out here. She just had it out there. I had started showing at the candy store in 1965. I would have a show every year. This was when I drew for my show of paintings at the candy store sometime in the 60s. Adeliza was looking for a place that she could open and perhaps get her sister to help where they could make their mother's famous almond nougat candy. They opened up as the candy store and made almond nougat candy from scratch, shelling the almonds, all this stuff. But then the health department came wandering in. Oh my gosh, you got to have this, you got to have that, you got to have, you know, a gazillion tools, you got to, you know, wear masks and gloves and blah, 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 blah. And so Annalisa decided that that was not for her. So she did the smart thing and she went to the universities and the colleges and found artists whose work she liked. She would only pick honest and meaningful artists. She was looking for some soul that the art had. And uh, she went to Arneson and, and he he loved Adeliza dearly till he died, but he, he was so surprised that this grandmotherly little woman came over and asked for some art for her gallery. So he gave her what he thought was really gross stuff. And she came back and asked if she could have more. And so Arneson told those of us that we all palled around and stuff, but Gil Hooley and me, and so to, to, to check her out. She just looked at, at my little bag of things and she said, I'll take them all. She sold everything I made. Yeah, some years I even made money. And of course, the, it mushroomed. I mean, Arneson would bring in people that he thought they'd enjoy, you know, like Louis Crusade Saceda. Clayton Bailey actually came out to California from Vermilion. I got a phone call from Adeliza one day. I had never met her or heard of her before. She said that she had seen my work at the Crocker Art Gallery and wanted to show some of it in her art gallery. Up in Folsom, which, you know, sounded uh, not like a, a place where, not in the, certainly not in the mainstream, Folsom is just a small, a small town up by Folsom Prison in the Folsom Dam out in the country. I told her to meet me at uh, the Belmonte Gallery, which was the, uh, uh, the only avant-garde gallery in town at the time. And um, 
sure enough, she showed up at the appointed time, and uh, we took something out of out of the uh, Belmonte storage area, and I gave it to her. And I got a call around later that afternoon, four o'clock something, and uh, Adeliza told me she had sold the picture and she wanted another. And I thought, well, that's pretty impressive because um, pictures are hard to sell. The candy store was a destination. We had wonderful parties up there, opening parties, and, and the artists that showed there were uh, became very clubby and, and uh, friendly and close to each other. And their children, the children used to just bounce around up there on opening days. There were a lot of kids around the candy store, all of the children of the artists, um, David Gahuli's kids and Roy DeForest's kids. and But I remember being taken to many, many openings and the thing about Eliza was that we would get there and she would always be friendly and offer lemon cake and be, or tea, and she, but she was really focused on the art. She was really focused on the artists. I got years of entertainment out of Clayton Bailey's Water Monster, which was just a big ceramic mouth with eyes submerged in water in a big basin. And I would just wait and wait and wait, and as the air, as the little tube filled the mouth up with air, it would slowly come up, and at some point, it would just burp. <laughs> All my dad's friends. <laughs> there was a, a strain of anti-intellectualism also in the Bay Area, because we've never had a lot of critics. Uh, there were, you know, a couple of critics for the local newspaper, Alfred Frankenstein, and later uh, Tom Albright, but there was never a real strong critical community that you would fear. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot of fear involved. There, there was a lot of freedom, you know, the artists felt a sense of freedom. And this goes for not only visual artists, but maybe poets and musicians. Uh, they retain a kind of childish delight in doing what they do. Uh, there's an artist I know, uh, Tony Natsoulis, who was one of the prize students of uh, Robert Arneson. And when he was a teenager, <coughs> he went to some of Arneson's classes and they, they visited uh, Clayton Bailey, who was about 20 years older than, than Tony at the time. And they visited Clayton's Mystery Museum. And Tony figured, wow, if somebody in his 30s can make a living doing this kind of stuff, that's for me, you know? I mean, fun, having fun, having a good time, you know? And so that, that was a whole lot of this attitude, you know? This is my workshop, where I do most of my metal work in this room. And over here is uh, my showroom, mostly metal work in here, too. And then back in here is the secret laboratory. Now here's a piece that I showed at the candy store back in 1970. This is Dr. Gladstone. Portrait of my sort of alter ego at the time. The brain in the bowl. I was just starting to do that when uh, Adeliza decided that my work was too weird and she couldn't sleep in the room with it at night. She didn't actually tell me, but she told other artists, and the word got back to me that uh, I was getting too weird for her taste. I saw the Funk Art Catalog when it came out, and I knew about the uh, artwork of a lot of the ceramic artists that were in that show. And I related to that because it, it had a sense of humor and a sense of uh, personal expression that I could appreciate. In fact, when I thought of f the word funk art, I thought of folk art as being kind of similar. But as uh, when we moved out to California and um, became part of the 
social uh, group of artists that were showing at the candy store and that were being called the funk artists. Um, we decided we were going to create a new name, Nut Art. And uh, David Zack wrote a number of articles for art magazines about nut art. And Roy DeForest wrote a manifesto about nut art. It says basically that uh, nut art is a phantasmagorical kind of art in which the uh, artist builds a personal world. In my mind, it was a reaction against uh, the high-powered New York art scene. And uh, the other thing was that when you're working out in the Midwest, or, or as Wiley has been quoted saying, when uh, nobody seems to be caring about what you're making anyway, you could just go ahead and make whatever you want to. And I think that was an attitude amongst the funk artists and the nut artists. You know, um, to start talking and do things without uh, regard for the big art world. It was an unusual uh, scene because when you met Adeliza McHugh, you wondered how would this meek little old lady ever sell art in the first place? <laughs> but I, I was really reassured by the fact that uh, Arnes and, and Gihuly both showed there. And I figured <laughs> she must have something going. She did sell a real weird uh, animal bust, uh, which I recently, just 40 years later now, uh, bought on eBay uh, from one of her uh, former employees. I called it Antler Lamp. It's kind of based on an idea that I got from my dad. Uh, my dad was a practical joker, and uh, he worked in a garage on cars. And one of the jokes they would play is that they would put a uh, light bulb into their nostril and pretend they were running around looking for a uh, handkerchief to collect this big snot bubble. So uh, that gave me the idea for the, to do this lamp with a couple of light bulbs that would light up and some real antlers. This is more typical of the kind of work that Adeliza liked and uh, exhibited. Uh, this is called a lizard lamp and it features a the nose, the pursed lips, and the little fingers of some kind of a fantastic uh, creature. It was a, a good social scene. Uh, I made uh, friendships that have lasted through, through the years. It says, my God, Clayton's 50. I think Betty had a 50th birthday party for me, and Bob brought this over. Wasn't that nice? I don't know why it rattles, though. Oh, here's a uh, Victor Sikansky tree tr trunk, too. That was made at TB9 in, in Davis. But I'm glad to be part of the, the, you know, the candy gallery uh, history. And it was a good period of time, introduction to California. And times we never forget. What I loved about Clayton's work is it was cartoony and it was kind of straight at the same time. Um, you know, very well done, but cartoon character kind of thing. So putting the two together really makes things beautiful. Plus it's very nostalgic of the, of the 1940s science fiction robots and the uh, flying saucers and different things like that with uh, his own twist in it. This is a sculpture I did of Clayton Bailey as Dr. Gladstone uh, this last year um, for the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art show that we are having together. Um, I first met uh, Clayton in 1977 at his Wonders of the World. It was absolutely amazing about how he made these big uh, cyclops skulls and Bigfoot bones, and he gave us permission basically to do anything that we wanted. 
After high school, I went to Sac State, and you could still feel the influence of Gladys Nielsen and Jim Nutt throughout all of Sac State and Sacramento. There were plenty of artists that were really influenced by them in their kind of wacky sensibilities and their kind of macabre uh, pieces. And of course, I've already seen their work at the candy store when I went up there. So after Sac State, I went back to, to UC Davis and studied with Arneson for five years. And uh, it was in TV9, which was the ceramics studio, and we all had keys to the studio. We could come and go anytime we wanted. We could fire as much as we wanted. Uh, studying with Arneson was fabulous. He, uh, he was very critical, but he treated us like artists. He would get us into shows. He would uh, get us into collections. He was very supportive. I met uh, Guhuli at uh, TB9 one summer and uh, was so great to, to, to meet him. He's uh, quite a wonderful person and a great artist. The history of Davis is very interesting, the way it came together, which was pretty much by accident. That Davis ever became an art department was, was a bloody miracle, to say the least. Richard Nelson was amazing. He hired all these people. Wiley and, and then eventually to Forrest and Arneson and Tebow and put together a department in the middle of nowhere, 80 miles from San Francisco. And this was a guy, he looked like your grandfather, you know, but he put together this department. It was incredible to get those people together. Uh, an incredible guy. And so I, I went to the first day of Arneson's class and there was me and 60 co-eds wanting to take the class. And he says, well, all I, all I can do is take art majors or minors. And so I said, oh, I am an art minor, <laughs> which was bloody, a total lie. Arneson just let us do anything he won. We were still using stoneware. But then, one summer I went back to visit my parents in Puerto Rico, and uh, when I came back, they had whiteware, the low fire white earthenware. And Arnest was making a toilet out of it. And uh, that was kind of amazing. Peter Vandenberg was there. And we were making our own glazes using uranium oxide and, and other deadly chemicals. I was Bob's assistant this whole time. Had to do all the firing and clay making and cleaning and, and all that stuff. At one point, I was Manuel Neri's assistant. And, I was taking classes from Wiley. Bruce Nauman was there uh, doing, as a student, doing stuff. It was a pretty neat place, but it was really this, this balance between the really hot people, like Arneson and myself, and then Roy DeForest, and then the cool people like Wiley and Nauman and Bill Allen. That's when Adeliza discovered us. As she always said, she, someone told her this stuff was going on at Davis and that she should come look at it or she should look at Arnes and stuff. She already had Marcus because he's really the first one who was showing there before we, any of us were. She loved to go to San Francisco and see stuff. She went to the Judy Chicago show. She got a terrible headache, just throbbing headache when she saw the work. But when she went to see the H.C. Westermans, it went away right away. That was one of her favorite museum stories. People didn't consider anything we did as art in the 60s. Uh, there was just no acceptance, because funk was the lowest of the low. It's something being washed down a gutter, you know, like barf or, or uh, crumbled cigarette packs washing down the gutter. And we use that imagery. I mean, certainly frogs and bricks. I have people, you call that art? I mean, Arneson would be attacked because he went around the, the country more and, you know, he had nuns attack him once in Wisconsin for what he was doing. I had nuns attack me at one point too. That's because I had Jesus uh, trying to convert a frog and, you know, things like that. A real human Jesus, you know, I didn't even at that time make Jesus a frog yet. I was still scared. Uh, eventually I overcame that. This is the gallery of the Museum of Art 
on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley. And this is the funk show. We thought we'd begin with a few notes from the catalog uh, uh, by the director of the museum, Peter Sells, on what funk is. I was very much surprised when I came uh, here from Museum of Modern Art in New York and arrived here in 1965 to see this particular kind of regional move, uh, uh, attitude, that's a much better word than movement, a regional attitude which, which we called funk. You know, which was uh, uh, really rejecting the whole art scene, the whole art world, which was making fun of f fun of things, uh, which was it was in a way the opposite of uh, of pop, because where pop you know, like uh, glor glorified consumerism, Funk put it down. Funk put down the art world, put down for consumerism, and. Uh, enjoyed as the erotic quality of art and, and, fr and free life. And with that kind of a free spirit, it's a spirit with an attitude and it was never a movement. Nobody paid, was paying attention to what's going on in California. You know, there was no, there were no sales. Uh, these guys didn't, they had to make their living teaching and they started a wonderful uh, teaching department at Davis and uh, they had fun. They really created this marvelous environment with uh, TB9 and all that, uh, which was really unique. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was unique. And uh, it was just, you know, this wonderful group of people. So there, it, there was really a situation here, this free-for-all situation. There were no, really no, no galleries where this work could be sold. There was no, no culture of criticism. The critics, uh, didn't know what to do with it because they didn't, it didn't fit into any category. They it didn't fit into anything they would write about. Using the term funk for this attitude originated in discussions I had at that time uh, with Harold Paris. And in a way, Harold Paris originated the term in an article that he wrote uh, for Art in America. When asked to define funk, artists generally answer, when you see it, you know it. It is largely a matter of attitude, and like many contemporary novels, films, and plays, funk art looks at things which traditionally were not meant to be looked at. Well, we have the catalog of the funk show, and uh, we had a very good designer, really original designer named Bruce Montgomery, who designed our catalogs back then. It has a page here which has all these different uh, Definitions of funk, which we found, so that was nice. And um, uh, here, the typewriter, the, Anderson gave that to the museum right after the show closed. Uh, the typewriter, and that's Manuel Neri. You know, later after that, he went into totally figurative uh, sculpture uh, made out of clay, uh, out, of, out of plaster, and out of marble. But then he did funky things like this, uh, uh, which is uh, just a glazed, a glazed ceramic. This is Harold Paris, the sculptor. This is a quote from him, and I'm going to read the whole thing because it's worth reading. In Los Angeles, art is consumed voraciously, a bargain table commodity. In San Francisco, in the Bay Area, in this bay of lethargy and social inertia, the artist here is aware that no one really sees his work, and nobody really supports his work. So in effect, he says, funk. I said here, funk has created a world where everything is possible, but nothing is probable. We've got a David Gulhuli here. Let me move this over here for you. This is actually the first piece that my wife and I bought from the candy store, and it was for our uh, wedding when we first got married. So that was 1977. And this is called On a Half Shell. And it's classic Gilhuli. It's got the little boat of frogs floating around in the ocean there. And then the birds kind of curiously looking in there, seeing what's going on. I, we really love that one. This is Jack Ogden. He's shown at the Candy Store Gallery as well. This is a self-portrait that he did in um, pastel, crayon. And uh, he was actually the man who um, uh, first told me about the candy store. 
gallery back in about 1966, I think. One of the great things about Adeliza was she was really into advocating people to buy and own art. So she would sell you art on time with no interest. Just whenever you got the money to pay her, you give her some and she was happy. This is El Filo. This is a sculpture by Luis Jimenez. We didn't know what El Filo meant, so I asked a friend of mine who was Spanish and um, he said it means the edge or on the edge. And when you look at this guy riding this motorcycle, it looks like he's accelerating, so he's definitely on the edge. She would always say, Ben, this is fine art, you know? And you'd be looking at a Gilhooly, and, you, and you know, I, I'm thinking fine art is something hanging in a museum. But she really and honestly believed, you know, this is fine art of today, and, and eventually it will become, you know, known in, known in history as fine art. And she was right, so far ahead of her time. She had incredible taste. Um, David Gilhooly said one time that Adeliza may not like everything that's good, but everything that Adeliza likes is good. This is a great one. Dear Sandy and Bob, that illusion I had selling art to developers collapsed, so it's back to the lottery. Good Lord, Adeliza. Adeliza had her own ideas about what was good art, and if you look at what she showed that she really loved, you could see it. You know, you could see a certain figuration, a certain wildness, a certain energy, whether it was Irving Marcus or, or Jack Ogden or Luis Cruz Azaceta she showed, um, or Bob, Maya, David Gilhooly. She liked a kind of real visceral energy. I would go up there and visit her sometimes in the middle of the week just because it was a great place to go out of the fog sometimes. And one of these days when I just stopped by to see her, she says, uh, I need to take this Roy DeForest drawing over to this person's house in Sacramento, in North Sacramento. So we go down the steps, come with me. So we go down the steps and we get in her little Volkswagen and we go over to this woman's house. And Adeliza knocks on the door and she just marches right in and she says, I don't know how you can stand and look at that boring art. She takes a Wayne Tebow off the wall and puts on, a, up there, a DeForest drawing and she says, I'll come back in a few weeks and see how you like that. This is the poster that um, Bob drew for the candy store when he and Roy DeForest had made a bunch of pots together. So it says Bob Arneson and Roy DeForest collaborate on making some pretty nifty pots. Bob and Roy Ware. What this is kind of like, you know, you got the terracotta figure on the outside that's very stern and very serious looking. And inside you have this other self-portrait where he's kind of laughing. Adeliza was not into decorative art. You know, you're not going to find this kind of art hanging in hospitals or hotel rooms or, or anywhere else. It's, you know, it's going to be in collections. But that's another thing. I mean, Adeliza, I mean, I've been to people's homes uh, in Sacramento. Uh, in fact, I like to do it when I uh, come out here is to go visit people that have collected. And a lot of them have some, they've got outstanding pieces that they would have never had if the candy store hadn't been there. I mean, Adeliza made it available, she made it affordable, 
I mean, you know, she did just about everything. I mean, she could convince people uh, to take a chance. I mean, I look at what I've collected over the years, and I'm not sure if it's my collection or hers. Uh, I don't know, she started me off on the right foot. Her motto was, I'd rather you grow into the art than grow out of it. it. Comes from the idea that art has a life of its own. I was one of her odd birds that come in and <laughs> want to talk art. She would say, does this art look as exciting as this art? And we would, that's how our afternoons would go. We would decide whether art was interesting and up to, uh, up to life, you know. We would talk for months about how great H.C. Westerman was. I had a, a modest little job in a bakery, cake decorating and making cakes, and she allowed me to buy art on time uh, at $50 a week. The Jim Nutt print. Gladys Nielsen, Roy DeForest print and drawing. All paid in full, and then the, here's her name and the signature. I bought lots of different things from her, and I've never re ever regretted toasters. Forget it. I, I'll complain day in, day out about toasters, VCRs, and stereos. Not once have I complained about any of the art. It's so much fun to have. People would go in there and she would make them buy. I mean, you had to buy. You didn't have to pay for it right away, which was a very important part of it. You had to buy it. You had to take it home and live with it. And if you didn't like it, you could bring it back. But she, she made the whole idea of producing art in Sacramento uh, worthwhile, I think. And Adeliza uh, probably, in my mind, changed the world around. She was a giant. We were lucky in this area to have her. As a kid, I mean, I was literally like 20, 24, 25 years old, and I was buying art. The first piece I bought was a little Suzanne Adan drawing, as a matter of fact. Suzanne Adan uh, did these, draw these little paintings on slate, and I bought one of those. And then I bought a little Jim Nutt. And also one thing that was really great about Adeliza, which is really important, is that it was really great to have somebody who understood naturally how to see the work. Um, it's easy to like artists once they're established and say, okay, let's bring Arneson and, 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 and Harry Hu group and, and, and Roy DeForest and, and we're gonna try to show those guys. But Adeliza had a natural eye and she just, she could see deeper. Adeliza had been married to Vincent McHugh. Vincent McHugh was a, a very well known and regarded writer of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And here is a picture of the handsome gent on the back of a novel called I Am Thinking of My Darling. Adeliza was from St. George, Utah, where her parents had had a ranch. So Adeliza was an accomplished horsewoman and whatnot. And uh, Vincent McHugh had come to that part of the world, and I guess they'd fallen in love. And so she and Vincent McHugh were living in New York on Long Island, where he was, among other things, one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, speechwriters. While in New York, Adeliza had, with Vincent McHugh, of course, visited all the museums and the galleries and the antique shops. And, and one of my favorite stories is that she, when she told me how she learned that she had the eye, because Vincent McHugh was, of course, interested in antique books and things. So they'd been in this antique uh, and whatnot shop. And, you know, being a 
nice husband, he'd asked Adeline if there's anything she wanted in that shop. And she said, had pointed to two little watercolors way up above the counter up there. And Vincent McHugh had turned to her and he said, now you've wound your own eye. Those are Winslow Homers. This painting, it's titled Gibbon, which is the type of monkey it is. It's much larger than any of the monkey paintings that I showed at the candy store because uh, the, the space there was, could only handle sm small works. I was interested in making a frame around this painting, which really came from looking at Jim Nutt's pieces at the time. I started teaching at Sac State in 1970, and the faculty was full of famous artists, many of whom I admired. The year that I was hired, Joan Brown was also hired, and Roger Vail and Steve Kaltenbach. And then we joined a faculty that involved Jim Nutt, Jack Ogden, Carlos Villa, William Allen, Irving Marcus. It was thrilling to do that. I mean, it, I felt like I was in company with many of my heroes. And uh, I, what could be better, you know? It was Jim Nutt and Gladys Nielsen that recommended me to Adeliza. I remember distinctly being in Jim Nutt's office. We were just chatting and and he said, you know, you should bring your work to Adeliza. I'm sure she would love to show your work. She was unusual in that she was willing to show work that was highly eccentric, uh, sometimes shocking. You could always count on seeing a great show there. Of all the places that you would think one couldn't have a successful gallery, she pulled it off in spades. When Jim Nutt and Gladys Nilsson and Carl and Laurie Gunn showed up, I was really impressed with, with their knowledge and their interest in art history. And secondly, their interest in the work of naive and primitive artists, uh, folk artists and just artists, uh, un, artists without the academic training. <laughs> The Harry Hu Show was a real breakthrough for me in a lot of ways because the students loved it and the, the public loved it. But there was a conservative segment of the faculty who hated it and they accused me of trying to uh, undermine the discipline they were trying to instill in the students by showing them that kind of work. Phil had arranged, Linares had arranged for the four of us to stay at one of his, one of the Art Institute gallery uh, patrons' houses, which was very nice. And uh, they, the, the couple was out of town for something, but their maid was there and she would cook us whatever we wanted for breakfast, which was a totally unheard of experience. And their daughter was also there. So she was really excited because she thought it was the who, not the hairy who. <laughs> As I recall, it was Irving Marcus that had uh, mentioned like, oh, by the way, you know, there's this little gallery and I'm sure she'd love to show the work. I mentioned you guys both to her and she was amenable and so on. What Irving said was, <laughs> he said, there's a really interesting, curious art, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and she is going to call you. So we get out to the candy store, and it's, of course, it's, it's charming and it's wonderful, and, and she's showing good stuff, and of course, I'm, you know, leaving my things there. I recall that, that it wasn't too long after we had dropped, I had dropped my work off and got back home that, you know, she called and had sold the, the pieces and, you know, might have had a little bitty check in hand. I don't know how she did it, but she did take people, because there were lots of people that, that wandered into the, because of the nature of the street that she was on, this historical street in Folsom, and the word candy store, assuming that she was selling candy. 
And she quite often got these people interested in, in these were people that had never been uh, particularly interested in, you know, in art or focused, that slowly would become collectors. So Gladys and I go to the, to the uh, uh, you know, go to Venice, and we were having lunch somewhere on, you know, one of these outdoor something or others. You know, everybody's, this is for the opening, so I mean, everybody in the art world is there. And anyway, somebody at the table said, well, what is this, uh, I, I noticed you have the, what is this candy store listed as the gallery store? And then from, from across the, the area, candy store, candy store. I know that I can tell you about the candy store and this guy runs over <laughs> and he's somebody who had, you know, knew Adeliza. He wasn't from Sacramento. He was an international, you know, or, you know, a global, whatever you want to call them, you know, a collector that runs in those kind of circles. He knew the candy store and quite often collectors who had been buying from these, uh, you know, artists, major dealers in the, in the big cities, if they got to California, they'd make the trek up to see Adeliza. Vincent yes, it, Price, <laughs> yes. She, uh, she was quite delighted with that. Answered the phone one day and, hello, Adeliza, yes. Well, this is Vincent Price. Oh, hi, well, come on out. You know. <laughs> we were the younger group, the group that Jim and Gladys would, uh, you know, at times they would uh, invite us to be part of a show that they were doing up there. And so we kind of then got introduced to the community but, too. And this is the thing about Adeliza. She made her gallery and her, she made herself very accessible to young students. So as a student, if you went up there, she was, um, she would give you all kinds of information, uh, talk to you about all the work, um, you felt like you were taking, in an odd way, an art class. They were Arneson students, they were Wiley students, they were Marcus students, they were um, you know, Jim and Gladys students who would go up there. So these people had a real influence um, on their students and, and were very instrumental, Jim and Gladys and Bob and Roy, in, in filtering younger people through Adeliza. She um, not only supported Sac Sacramento State College artists uh, and professors and UC Davis artists and professors, but she also supported, I mean, she would get Art Forum and she would go through every article and every, uh, you know, advertisement looking to see if she could find other artists to show at the candy store. And I think she was able to get Louis Jimenez's phone number. He had a show up there. Louis Cruz has Cecita. I mean, she was able to kind of go beyond California. Welcome to my studio, I call it the bunker. I've been here since 1994, and I'm really running out of space. As you can see, I'm a very prolific artist. I produce more than what I sell, a small percentage of sales a year. So I overproduce, but I don't care because to me, art is very important for me. It's like, uh, I, it's a need to, to do art. And not in terms of selling, a, need, a physical and a spiritual need for me too. Be, be an artist and produce art. Look at this one. Bob Arneson brought me to California to teach in 1980. He saw, we show in the same gallery in New York with Alan Frumpkin. And uh, so he saw my work and liked it and um, invited me to go and teach. And I wasn't sure because I never taught before. I didn't have no degrees. So I said, well, what can I teach? And then he said, don't worry about it. You come in and uh, you'll do it. And, and that's what I did. I went to Davis and uh, I started teaching drawings and paintings. He told me that was his old ladies in Folsom with a gallery called Candy Store Gallery that he would like to introduce me to her. And I said, well, Bob, that sounds terrific. Why not? So we went there. And as soon as we walk in, I see this old lady kind of smiling, looking at me. And uh, he introduced me. He says, uh, this is a Louis Cruz of Sassetta the future Cuban Picasso. 
And then she started laughing, and these three of us started laughing. I didn't want to contradict them, <laughs> so I left her like that. Bob was very sardonic, and, and that's why I like him, you know, because he was a rascal too. That's why he liked Caralaisa too. They, they got along really well. She walked me around the gallery, and I knew some of the artists that she represents there. Of course, uh, Roy DeForest, Arneson, you know, um, some of the Harry Who artists from uh, Chicago. She said, you know, I'd like to get some of your drawings, and so I brought a few drawings to her, and to my surprise, she started selling them. And then after I left um, California, uh, I came back to New York, and uh, every month or every two months, she would ask me for more drawings and she will sell them. I'm, I'm talking about very violent, grotesque kind of drawings, you know, and I said, wow, I don't know how at Eliza, you know, advertising a candy store gallery, you know what I mean, selling chocolate and candy, selling this kind of work. So I was really, I said, man, this lady is amazing, you know. I graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 69. I waited five years doing a lot of works to find my own iconography, my own voice. Took me that time. I didn't rush it to run to galleries because I made a few paintings. I have already done maybe two or 300 paintings before I went to with a list. And uh, uh, I headed Alan Franken on top of 10 galleries in New York. And I went to see him with two diptychs rolled up, huge paintings. I'm in the middle of the gallery with those tubes, and I see him in the office. He's coming out. What are you doing? Like, uh, you're ready to kick me out, right? Yeah. And I said, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm an artist, and I'd like to show you my work. He looked at me up and down. He said, we don't do that. You know, you have to make an appointment with me. I look at slides at that time. Oh, yeah. And if I like the work, I might visit you in a month or whatever. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Frumpkin. I didn't know how things work, you know? So he looked at me again. I said, I have the work here. Nobody's in the gallery, you know? I said, okay, so he brought me to that Jackson room next to his office. He said, unroll the canvases there. I unrolled them. And when I called him, he looked at the painting like this, you know, and he smiled. And when he smiled and asked my name, I knew I got him. A lot of collectors now are looking for my old work that I couldn't sell way back. Yeah. Now they want all these works, you know? It's amazing. Okay. Look at that. I wonder if yeah. Eliza would have taken something like this. Oh, she would have loved this. Yeah. No question about it. I always told my wife, I think in the future, uh, Eliza deserves some kind of plaque or monument in Folsom by the art community there because there she is in the middle of hardly anywhere that's on Sacramento or, or, or San Francisco. And to be able to do what she did, you know, helping those local artists in the area, that was remarkable. There were two ladies who came in and they were looking for a seascape. And she had the Ace of Seda boats in the head, hands <laughs> in the boats. And so she walked them over oh to the East and said, well, here's a pair of seascapes. And they kind of looked, you know, couldn't no, get out of there enough. fast enough. <laughs> yes. You have an excerpt from that German uh, uh, guidebook, don't right. you? It's a German guidebook. The editors about. or whatever came by here and they bought some art. And they included it as one of the three must-see places in California. California, along with Yosemite. I do know that Adelaide, at least that's what she told us, felt as if Maya was way out there being creative on her own, that she wasn't being influenced by anyone else and that there was no one like Maya. It does not interest me to be a chronicler of the evil side of things. It's a complex process and it is both time consuming and not because I'm always thinking of new things and or what to do 
on a specific thing. And I take very seriously what I paint on my shoes. Today we have two yellow dogs that, that are facing opposite directions with their tongues out with a pink crocodile on one side and an elephant on the other side. Well, I can remember walking into uh, the candy store, and this was on the, I think, the front main wall. And uh, Maya had a, a series of uh, these large pieces. I think this was called her Mountain Series or something. And uh, we immediately uh, liked it and decided to purchase it. This is uh, another one of uh, Maya's larger works. It's called Rhino River by the Rose Rocks with the Rabbit Riders in the Redwoods. I think the biggest frustration that uh, Adeliza had is she saw so much copying of art by artists and she didn't see the, the originality that she definitely saw in Maya's work. She would try to help you really get the, the joy from art and that was the reason you bought it. She didn't want to sell art to people who were trying to match their sofa. This, you know, is a Peter Vandenberg platter. This is called Sister Mary Sees the Holy Ghost. And it was one of the first pieces, uh, the ceramic pieces that we purchased. I think I told you that we uh, lived near the river before, the American River, in three different occasions when we were concerned about flooding. We loaded up a, a moving van with our art and uh, we, we could lose anything in the house, but we couldn't lose our art. <laughs> then we moved on to a little bit bigger piece of Peter Vandenberg. I think it's called Mediterranean Lady. And we thought it was really interesting. I, you know, we have several pieces to it. We have this, and then we also have this cat that, you know, entirely comes out. It's a full piece. We thought that was kind of clever. Bob Arneson took pictures of her when she was in the gallery, and unbeknownst to, uh, to her, he made this. House Mother for Odd Birds. And... I guess that was uh, the candy store you see up there and all the artists around it that are the odd birds on top of Aunt Liza's head. I just love the way that she was, you know, she, she feels so at ease, basically, you know. She crocheted, you know, and she um, would tell stories and she would... Um, be in a rocking chair, you know, that you had. And, um, so you felt at home, really, there. That's what it was, you know, you felt at home. And I'd never seen, you know, uh, a place where they sell art and it's also someone's home and you can feel totally at ease and enjoy all the, the good things, which was, you know, um, all of it was, was good. It really was. It, was. it was outstanding, you know. It probably never happened again. I doubt it. I doubt it. That just happens once and that's it, you know. I think that it was for her health. It was probably best not to have her going up and down those, but for her uh, soul, I think it was sad that she couldn't open another candy store. It's a, a, a real tribute, I guess, that she is still remembered.